Composite words are easy to say, but hard to, for me, they're hard to verbalize because there's so much depth in it. Mm -hmm. it you know, the surface words are, I repent, Lord, how many times have I said, I repent, you know, and then back to the old behavior. But then crying out and repenting is a different repentance. It's to the soul of you. And I've probably reached there two or three times in my life, which were life-saving. Welcome to I've Got a Story to Tell with Dan Skinkus. This is Season 2, Episode 7. You know, today I was in Bible study and I came to a point where that scripture uh, came up was that God does not despise a broken or contrite spirit. And uh, that really meant a lot to me. And I sort of focused on my boot camp experience at the uh, age of 23. I was drafted into the army and uh, I thought I wouldn't ever get drafted because I have my age and they were drafting 18, 19, 20 year olds. And there I was thinking, I, oh, man, I've missed this bullet. And I got that letter in the mail that said, greetings from the President of the United States. I was petrified. And so the next thing I know, I'm on a train to Scranton, Pennsylvania. And from Scranton, we went to uh, uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and that was the journey that we were on from Scranton to Jackson, uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. So we all boarded to train as young men, and uh, they were really nice cars. They were like the old-fashioned wooden uh, sleeping cars, and then there was the, the uh, diner car, and uh, the supportive staff were all the black guys, and they all were dressed up in their um, uh, uniforms and so uh, we thought wow this this is good this is good we we felt like super secure in knowing that we we're gonna leave our home we were heartbroken but to know that this could be not as bad as we thought it was like going to the doctor's office and thinking oh that shot isn't gonna be as bad as I think and so uh, the train starts rolling at 5 in the morning and uh, we are now on our way to Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And uh, so we're on the sleeping cars and they're all like uh, very nice, you know, rumbling down the tracks, clickety, clickety, click, you know, and we're going to sleep and everything's so nice. And we wake up in the morning and get dressed and we're invited into the dining car where they had the white uh, tablecloths and all the sterling silverware and the plates different plates and they ask us politely what we would like to eat and we said oh bacon and eggs and then they bring them to us and the black men, uh, gentleman would have the uh white towel white linen towel on his you know it looked like something out of a, a, a movie and so we were all like settled into this great life that was coming before us and not worry too much that if this is the uh, this is what the army is uh, allowing you to have in your life early on in your boot camp experience it can't be that bad and so we end up at I'm gonna say 10 o'clock at night Fort Jackson South Carolina and it's in the middle of summer it is still hot and humid at Fort Jackson South Carolina and the next thing we know, um, we start getting off and we hear this people yelling and scree screaming and we can't identify it. And now it's coming closer to us and there must have been eight drill sergeants heading our way, starched to the tens with the swagger sticks and he's screaming at it, get off that train. You better get off that train. No, you better get off. <laughs> we're like, and so we're like, 
stepping off the train. No, they said, you run off that train. You get off that train. So we go into the bus. So they said, over there in those buses, get in those buses. And they're screaming and yelling. And we're running like scared uh, deer <laughs> like across the parking lot. We get into the buses and they take those swagger sticks and start beating on those buses. The drama of being in this wonderful place of going there and now we're getting there. We finally get into the barracks and uh, it's, I would say, one or two by the time we get into the barracks and we settle in for the night. And two hours later, there's somebody banging on a trash can with a swagger stick. You better get out of bed. You better get out of bed. We're <coughs> wondering, we just got in bed. Better stand at attention. And so we're all standing at attention at our beds. And they start going around and uh, this, the guy comes and he says, I want to introduce myself. My, my name is uh, Sergeant Edwards. And this little black guy, he's in our faces. And, and, uh, and he says, you know what to call me? And we say, uh, Sergeant Edwards. He says, no, you call me. Yes, sir. That's who you call me. And then uh, there was another guy, uh, Sergeant McGee, who was like six foot four, the biggest black guy you've ever wanted to see. Terrified. We were terrified. And he would get in our faces. And then finally, uh, after it was over, after he walked around that barracks, then they would say, uh, get back in your bed. And so we'd get back in our bed. And just settle in at four o'clock, same thing, man. Two hours at a time, that's all they would give us, and they start banging. The next morning, <clears throat> we're finally getting out of bed, and it's the same attitude, and we're wondering, oh my God, are we gonna, there was guys crying in their bunks. They, uh, guys that had knives from New York, they were like breaking us all down, taking the knives, switchblades from these guys. They all had a switch, some of them had switchblades. I went over to the mess hall and the line was like 50 guys until you could get and then and then when you were in the mess hall they would be banging on your table eat that food eat that food eat that food and from that point on these guys were in our face constantly there was no relaxation we had to pick up cigarette butts like make a whole line of guys picking up cigarette butts and they were constantly driving us and then uh the forced march came, a uh, five mile march, and it was uh, at night. And we started marching five miles, and it was fast and furious. And we we're thinking, oh man, we're going to die out here. We're just not going to make it. And uh, I remember there was one guy that gave this Sergeant Edwards, who was like a five foot, maybe five foot tall gentleman, and this one guy is giving him grief and that guy we're on a hill and this hill is about a 20 foot 30 foot embankment and I'm not making this any more than it is and that guy gave him some verbiage and he took his fist and knocked that guy right off the off the bank and he slid down the hill you know and and we see more of that in today's economy in that army and everything that wouldn't happen but that happened in those days and we saw a lot of guys if you mouthed off man we knew better after a couple times and then uh, uh, we went on this forced march and then we came back and it was at night uh, and what they would do is they would allow you to sleep for five minutes and then wake you up and, and constantly on you it looked like one of those marine clips uh, from boot camp and so we got back to the camp and all of a sudden we thought finally a hot shower and we were wet and humid and uh, they were told not to fire up those furnaces we had no hot water we all had to take cold hot, cold uh, showers and so you know I just want to put in perspective from Playing in a rock and roll band in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and having every living at home with my mom and dad, and having that difference in my life all of a sudden was super traumatic. I caught pneumonia. People, uh, I was sent to the hospital. Uh, people were dying around me. It was a uh, 
a plague of uh, pneumonia, and uh, God got me through that. He, he got me through that. And a sergeant came into my room after uh, they were about five weeks I was away from boot camp, and he said, you got two choices. He says, one, you could lay here, and and the way they treated you, even if you were sick there, you could lay in this bed and baby yourself, and you know, we couldn't breathe, we could, or you could come back to boot camp. You got two weeks left. You either do the two weeks or you're gonna do eight more weeks. So a lot of us just stumbled out of those beds and we were like half dead and we and we went through it. And God's hand was, I know I look back, his hand was on me. And so uh, at the end of this whole process of, uh, of, uh, fear and now we were starting to get confidence we were starting to get confidence knowing that those cold showers do it again or take me out there again i'm not gonna i'm not gonna be afraid of this i'm gonna just endure it and at the end of it these two gentlemen became like i look at the training that they're from their heart that they put us through was for our good, not theirs. It had all to do with us. And they were concerned being, came. they came back from Vietnam. They saw the pain, the suffering. They wanted us to be prepared, you know? And uh, it was quite a life experience to go through that. And I said all of this to come to this boot camp experience that I've had with Jesus Christ. And that boot camp experience started uh, some 45 years ago. And uh, finding Jesus was the one thing that I couldn't completely understand the first two or three days of that walk with Jesus. <laughs> Listening to I've Got a Story to Tell with Dan Skinkis. We'll be right back after these messages. Night Off the Streets provides a place for homeless to sleep out of the cold. We need your help. I had no intention of volunteering. Then I did because it needed to be done. The miracle is that I have been more blessed than they. 
Won't you share a little of your time to give someone a warm place to go overnight? Welcome back to I've Got a Story to Tell with Dan Skinkus. Yeah, in all honesty, uh, I thought I would be truly a preacher in front of the camera. And you know, I went out there and I traveled this country a few times and spoke in missions, churches and everything. And I thought that God would step me up and I would be that guy that... <laughs> and you know, my life has been a wonderful breaking and a contrite spirit because that never happened to Dan. And I'm sitting here trying to tell you in my, all the honesty without all the blood, guts, and the tears of life that I went through, that I thought I would go in one direction and I failed, and I failed. But I would get up again and I would be walking toward saying, how's this walk, Lord? How's this? You know, is this good enough? And then, I would fail and I would be broken and I would be torn down. And there was a persistence that I had to know, I gotta keep walking that way, no matter how much I'm broken. And now how much, and I look up to God to this day and I, and I look at him and I said, forgive me, Lord. I'm just not who I think you want me to be. And with that broken and contrite spirit, I rec recognize I'm talking 45 years. I'm talking thousands of Bible studies. I'm talking about communion over and over again. I'm talking about working with the street people. Uh, you know, all of those things that I kept walking forward that I thought were plateaus became this road that God put me on to show me his love for me and other people because I can't qualify. I can't bring enough to the table. I can't, you know, one time I was so broken, I said, no, you, broken is broken. Broken isn't fragmented. Broken is broken. It's separated. And I came, and I said, God, what can I bring to your table? And he said, don't bring a thing to my table. I've done, I've done it all for you, Dave. You know, being, being broken, like I said, is just broken. It's not, it's not fragmented. It's just all broken apart. And when you're just that desperate and you cry out, you know, I believe this to the bottom of my heart. I don't know about your life, and I think, you know, we pray our prayers every day. We look at God every day. We love the Lord. We we pray, make this a good day, Lord, and, and all of those things. But when crisis comes, God brings that crisis. So now we're serious. We're, we're as looking him straight in the eyes with all the earnestness at our command. We're saying to God, Help me, Lord. No. You know, and when I came to God and I finally was broken enough and I said to him, I got to bring something to your table, Lord. I can't, I got, I can't. He said, don't bring a thing to my table. Sort of like there's nothing to bring. You're, whatever you bring me is like filthy rags. Look at what my son did for you. That's what it's about. Are you sure I can't bring... I gotta be a better Christian. I gotta read the word more. I gotta, and uh, finally realizing that everything you have is everything there is because of God's power. His son gave you everything, eternal life, a life beyond this life that we think is so important. But if you live long enough, you recognize the fact that you can't do it anymore. You're, God has given you everything. 
It's a wonderful thing to get to that place that it's not about works at all. It's about love. And, uh, yeah. I was told in some of those places that um, I would fall down and I'd repent and I'd get back up again. And uh, I would walk, a strong walk. I'm going to do it right this time, Lord. I'm going to bring you everything and fall down again and then get back up and then run away and run away. And the one time I came to the Lord with all that compassion of really, I don't care, Lord, if you send me to hell, but I got to be honest with you. Uh, and he looked at me and said, the next time you fall down, get up and look me in the eyes and I'll tell you, I love you. I never ran away from the Lord since then. Been here with him. You're listening to I've Got a Story to Tell with Dan Skinkis. We'll be right back after these messages. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Hi, I'm Rob Scanland, and my favorite Bible verse is John 3, 16. A number of years ago, Jenny and I attended a Bible study here at church facilitated by our beloved Dwayne Glansman. In that church, in that Bible study, uh, we had a, the usual assortment of people that included both new and old members. And one of the folks who participated, a husband and wife, were new members and they'd been attending just a few weeks to our church. And the gentleman was uh, quite knowledgeable about the Bible. So one Sunday after class, he approached me and um, asked if I was involved in the church. And I said that, yeah, both Jenny and I were pretty, pretty involved. And he asked if I'd be willing to meet with him uh, some time for coffee because he had some questions that he would like to have answered. So later that week, I met him at Starbucks here in Carson City. and. Um, he asked a number of kind of general questions about the church and, and my involvement. And, uh, and then we talked a little bit more about um, uh, the church in general. And then I asked him about his church involvement and, um, and what he did for a living. And at that point, he asked me the question that all of us who are doing the Great Cloud of Witnesses were asked as well. And that is, what's your favorite Bible verse? So I stuttered and stammered for a minute and uh, rather flat-footed said, well, John 3.16. So he opened his Bible and he then read John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. And after reading it, he looked me straight in the eye and said, you don't really believe that God so loved the world. Think of all the things that he's done to the world over the many years, particularly in the New Testament, where he brought the great flood and where there were countless plagues and uh, smiting of uh, vast numbers of people uh, and on and on. And I, needless to say, was rather shocked and uh, kind of dumbfounded of his challenging of what I felt was my faith. So uh, I didn't quite know what to do. So we chatted a little bit further and, uh, and then uh, parted ways. And uh, he attended church, he and his wife attended church for the next couple of weeks. And then um, they disappeared. And I've never seen them since. And probably that's been 10 years ago. So interestingly, after that encounter, 
I heard the verse John 3.16 kind of over and over again, both in sermons uh, here at church and, and other places, in articles that I'd read on Pilgrim Radio, kind of time and again it was reinforced that this was an important verse in the Bible. And it strengthened my belief that it was my favorite verse and that uh, I, I really did believe it and that God did so love the world. So I went um, just recently in preparation for this and looked at the verses that preceded John 3.16. Verse 14 and 15 read, And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And then following uh, John 3.16, uh, it begins, Indeed, kind of reaffirming the, the, the verse above, that God did so love the world. God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. I now see more clearly the indeed that I just referenced, that God did so love the world that he gave his only Son to save us from our sins, to sanctify those who believe. And as time has gone on, I've reflected back on this encounter and wondered if this guy was an agent of the devil sent to kind of um, cause doubt and, and divide the body, or if he was a someone sent from God to remind us all that we need to be ready to defend the faith. That day in the coffee shop, I was wearing a shirt and a uh, shorts and a t-shirt, and I needed to be wearing the full armor of God. And so, reflecting back, I have tried to go beyond the darkness, get beyond the darkness of that moment as I saw it, and be continually reminded to be, to study, to pray, to be ready at all times to defend the faith. Got a story to tell with Dan Skinkus. The Holy Spirit put me in my place today is that gratitude of what God gives you is what He's looking for. I've got a story to tell with Dan Skinkus is a Presby Pod production of Aunt Betty's Studios, a ministry of First Presbyterian Church, Carson City.